Paul Tyler, who was at that time the chief of the Defense Nuclear Agency, Radiological Defense, usually picks me up at the airport in Washington and takes me back to the plane. And last February, he said, Bob, did you see the article in the January Omni magazine on Meg Patterson's magic black box? I said, yeah. He said, well, aren't you interested? I said, yeah. He said, why don't you look her up and see if there's anything we can do for her to get this thing broken loose and uh, into the mainstream. Now, this was an honest effort by Paul Tyler, who attends all of these conferences, to be of assistance to Meg, because he was aware of the work that she had done with I-4 Capel at the Curie Institute and a number of other workers. So when I got to Los Angeles, I gave her a call, introduced myself, said that the fellow who is in charge of this stuff for the Food and Drug Administration uh, asks if he can extend any courtesy in helping you to get either type approval or what have you. She said, well, I cannot talk to anyone. I have contractual arrangement with the NET, Neuroelectric Therapy Group, in at that time, they were near the John Wayne Airport. But under the circumstances, we can call a meeting. Well, this was perhaps one of the most remarkable meetings I've ever attended in my entire life. Uh, at one end of the table was the principal investor, who at this time had raised about three and one-half million dollars to develop the black box brain tuner, the neuroelectric therapy device. There were three of the staff scientists and the president of the financial company, called TLC, no, uh, <laughs> very bad analogy, it was, uh, the middle word was leverage uh, corporation, uh, I think it was uh, Turner Leverage Corporation or something, it had nothing to do with tender loving care. Meg had been brought to this country in August of 1981 to develop a device which had been built for her by Shackman Instruments in England, which was an outgrowth of the original WEN work. And I brought some of these instruments here in case we have any technical types to actually show you what they look like. The history of this is that Meg Patterson, while working as an abdominal surgeon at the Tonghua Hospital in Hong Kong, had come across Dr. WEN, W-E-N, and his use of electroacupuncture for anesthesia. And Dr. Wen had discovered, quite accidentally, that many of his patients were on heroin. At this time, 1970 to 72 in Hong Kong, a $500 a day habit in the United States would cost less than a pack of cigarettes in Hong Kong. And about 20% of the gross population that would go through the Tonghua Hospital in Hong Kong, Kowloon, were uh, heroin addicts. So he, doing hundreds of surgeries a month, a certain percentage of these people who were heroin addicts began to report, I'm not feeling any discomfort. I don't have withdrawal pains. They would go back on the street after surgery, get a fix from their usual mother, and find that the fix had not given them the same effect. There were a number of fights because they thought their heroin was being cut etc., but it was a very interesting political uh, situation. So Dr. Wen did what any cool scientist would do. He began doing rat studies. Now, <laughs> mega rats. Right. Uh, I'll digress for a moment here and say that heroin, or opiates as a class, opium, morphine, heroin, and a number of the synthetics that are manufactured in the ethical pharmaceutical houses, simply overload the body's production of normal endorphins. Beta endorphin was discovered around 1975 as a painkiller that the body manufactures that is about 100 times as effective as morphine as a painkiller. When you don't have it, you get the aches and pains, the withdrawal, the stomach cramps, the nausea, the insomnia, all of these horrible things that attend withdrawal. When you give your body massive doses, or even small doses in the beginning, of any of the opiates, the part of the brain that says build neurotransmitters 
simply says shut down. We have too much. So when you get off of the substance, when you try to kick it cold turkey, the body is in agony because those little factories in the brain simply don't produce the endorphins. The word endorphin comes from N endogenous orphan after morphine. It simply means endogenous or built-in morphine. About five or six years ago, there were some 40 known neurotransmitters, uh, serotonin being one of the most famous. At this time, there are over 2,000 that have been identified, and they're still counting. So the brain is an exceedingly complex little factory. Remember the days in school when they said, well, you're worth about five dollars. You've got two pounds of salt, some potassium, some carbon, some hydrogen. Try to buy some uh, a gram of interferon for under eight or ten thousand dollars. The body is far more complex than this set of chemicals that we held so dear in grade school. What Dr. Wen did was to hook the rats on heroin have two groups, one control and one uh, active. He would cut off the heads of the rats and run chromatography, uh, electrophoresis chromatography, to find out what some of these trace proteins were in the control and the sample. The rats who had been hooked on heroin and suddenly cut off that were pretty miserable rats showed that it took maybe a week to three weeks before the neurotransmitters would again reappear, the exact range of time that the withdrawal symptoms occupy uh, somebody coming off of a narcotic. The rats, which were taken totally cold turkey off of heroin, which had been stimulated with two little clips, and I have the photographs of all this in the documentation, fascinating work, and were given electro stimulation at around 111 hertz, and we'll talk about this later, showed that within 40 minutes of the time that the voltage was applied, the brain's ability to produce its own neurotransmitters had been rehabilitated, and that within three to five days it had reached normal. Now the implications of this were rather stunning. How many people do we have in this country who are on Valium, Librium, Uppers, Downers, legal narcotics that are highly addictive? You probably remember that during uh, World War, or rather the Civil War, American Civil War, when morphine was invented to replace some of the other opiates, they said, oh, here, we have a painkiller that's totally non-addictive. They've said this about almost every other drug that has seen the light of day. In fact, boys and girls, if it isn't addictive, they don't want to sell it. Did you realize that there is a $13.6 billion legal pharmaceutical trade in mood-altering drugs such as Valium and Librium, and that there is about a $20 billion market from the same drug manufacturers in the United States that export it to Mexico, where they do not have these type uh, pharmaceutical controls prescription which comes back onto the streets of the United States that is close to 36 billion dollars a year at the retail level Now nobody wants to interrupt this trade tobacco which is four and one half times more addictive than heroin this study was done here at the Veterans Administration Hospital Sepulveda by Dr. Krober in 1974 it had been found that GIs coming back from Vietnam, who had several habits, tobacco, heroin, others, could be gotten off of heroin within 72 to hours to a week, but it was almost impossible to get them off of tobacco. So a study was done which established that the withdrawal time on tobacco could run up to two years, that it was four and a half times more physically addictive than heroin. This is hardcore scientific data. Would you like to see the American tobacco industry stop paying taxes? Their net is around $27 billion a year. Now, if we look at the liquor industry, where 90% of the drinking, the alcoholic consumption in dollar volume, is consumed by 
of the drinking population, these are big dollars. <laughs>